I personally got acquainted and enchanted by jazz music while studying in the early 80s in the United States. We used to go from the Stanford University campus almost every month to the Richmond Bay where there were performances of jazz music accompanied with cheese and wine. And while spending three sabbaticals later on at Berkeley University, I was privileged to listen to many concerts, jazz concerts, performed by the California Jazz Conservatory of California. My husband, who accompanied me, he played 35 years in the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra and was invited sometimes to perform in this concert when they combined classical music with jazz like Gertrude's Rhapsody of Blue. In blue, Rhapsody in blue. Jazz currently is the most complex phenomena with more, I learned, 70, 50 different styles and genres. And there are two polar standpoints as to the importance of academic study of jazz. I am going to quote two jazz giants that uh, exhibit these two polar uh, standpoints. One is Louis Armstrong, who said, if you have to ask what jazz is, you'll never know. And Winton Marsalis said, Jazz is not just well men. This is what I feel like playing. It is a very structured thing that comes down from a tradition and requires a lot of thought and study. This conference obvious agrees more with Marsalis. The first panel of this conference will deal with the political and literary uh, manifestations of jazz and the second panel will deal with the history of jazz in Israel since the 1930s and it will be followed by an exhibition and later on by a concert. I wish you all a most insightful and enjoyable conference. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to invite our first speaker, Dr. Wolfram Knoa, who is the director of the Jazz Institute in Darmstadt since its inception in 1990. He's published several books among them the critical studies of Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, and just the last year, and I was actually at the Institute when he got the books, uh, a book on Duke Ellington. He has taught at several schools and university and was appointed the first non-American Louis Armstrong Professor of Jazz Studies at the Center of Jazz Studies, Columbia University, New York, for spring 2008. Wolfram Knoa. Um, may I add a third um, <laughs> that I just heard from Dan Gottfried, who basically gave me the idea of what your next conference could be about. This conference is about jazz uh, in, in, the, in the 20th century, and he, said, he just said, jazz is alive. So, so that's actually true. Um, let me see how I manage with my material here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about jazz and politics, and I will bring you through the. I will actually bring you through the history of uh, the 20th century up to recent years. And actually, I will start by playing you a relatively gloomy example, <clears throat> which some of you may still remember. Uh, on the 17th of June, 2015 the 20-year-old white American Dylan Roof shot nine African-American members of the community of Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, among them the senior pastor of the church and democratic member of the South Carolina Senate, Clementa C. Pinckney. One week later, on the 26th of June, President Barack Obama took part in a memorial service for those killed during the terrorist attack. At the end of his speech, this happened. Now let's see, where are we? Amazing grace. Amazing grace. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Clementa Pickney found that grace. Cynthia Hurd found that grace. Susie Jackson found that grace. Ethel Lance found that grace. The Payne Middleton doctor found that grace. Tywanza Sanders found that grace. Daniel L. Simmons Sr. found that grace. Sharonda Coleman Singleton found that grace. Myra Thompson found that grace. Through the example of their lives, they've now passed it on to us. May we find ourselves worthy of that precious and extraordinary gift. As long as our lives endure, may grace now lead them home. May God continue to shed his grace on the United States of America. Let me leave you with this without explaining too much about this clip. I thought it was important to play it at the beginning in order to set the tone, but also because the attack was just three years ago and might be remembered by some of you. Such direct affection can help explain some of the things that I will focus on during my talk. Chapter one, double, double entendre, the subversive power of music. Blues is all about ambiguity about double entendre. Just listen to the lyrics of early blues singers. Bessie Smith's I need a little sugar in my bowl becomes pretty non-ambiguous once she intersects come on hard, papa. And when Dinah Washington sings of her dentist in the Long John Blues, when she starts praising his drilling after her, his diagnosis told her that her cavity needed filling, you get an idea that this is far from a customer ranking on you might find these days on the internet. African American culture knows a game which is simply called the dozen, and which allows you to insult members of your group and have them insult you until one of you gives up. Such insults can get quite extreme and won't even stop of the mother of the one insulted who is blamed of the worst sexual activities. The dozen is an old game, but it has been kept alive all the way into, today, uh, into today's hip hop slang. When hip hoppers greet themselves by shouting, yo, or yo mama, they are unwittingly, unwittingly just starting a new series of insults about your mother. Anthropologists have traced the dozen back to the traditions in Africa. It's a game with words, an argument using the most elaborate insults while everyone, everyone involved knows that these do not mean a lack of respect. The dozen is being played by kids just as much as by grown-ups. Whoever is part of the culture knows will know when he is being served by a line from the dozen and whoever is an outsider uh, might just be taken aback a bit. The dozen is an important part of the African-American cultural tradition because it uses ambiguity. I insult your mother, but actually we will connect even deeper by covering each other with insults. <laughs> 
during the slavery period, it was necessary to learn codes in order to convey messages. Codes allowed the slaves to keep the few freedoms they had secret. They were necessary to plan revolts, jailbreaks, or escapes. Black life soon depended on a sort of second coded language which the plantation masters did not understand. The codes used by the Underground Railroad, that hundreds of miles long escape route taken by many slaves to reach the freedom of the North, made use of train porter terminology or of the language of the church. In this code, an agent was the person who planned the escape baggage, were the escaped slaves who were handed from station to station along their route, Canaan or heaven or the promised land all stood for Canada, one of the safe destinations. River Jordan was the Ohio River, the border between the slave holding south and the north. Biblical shepherds meant supporters on the way and so on and so forth. Many of these terms found their way into the songs of the time. The only assembly allowed to the slaves was church service because the white slaveholders may have seen their cheap labor as far below them. However, according to the laws of Christian mission, could or would not block the way to God for them. And thus, most African-American spirituals are full of ambiguous references to a possible escape. Songs such as Wade in the Water, or Steal Away, or Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming For To Carry Me Home, had quite a different message for the congregation than for outsiders. Music in such instances always possessed subversive qualities. After all, music is about more than just melodic or harmonic movement. It conveys emotion, memories, hope. As part of the African American church service, thus the Christian message of redemption had an additional message uh, an additional meaning from the early 19th century already. For the slaves, redemption stood just as much for the redemption in the Christian sense as it stood for the general changes of the status quo. Thus, in a shout like, let me free, O Lord, the Christian meaning of redemption is just as much present as is the quite real experience of captivity, of slavery, of racism, and injustice. Black gospel music, the blues, early jazz, kept part of that spirit of resistance. All three of them, and jazz probably most of all, talked about the individuality of humans, of freedom, and of the choice, of the chance that even if each and everyone follows his or, or her own way and abilities, they might be able to achieve a collective result and contribute to being a community. Chapter two, about the difficulty to tame music. Totalitarian regimes hate jazz. Its emphasis on individuality does not fit into systems which want to keep control of every one of their citizens. The Nazis hated jazz for a number of reasons. For one, African Americans clearly were not the master race. They saw themselves as. Also, jazz being some sort of pop music of its time aroused much too many emotions uh, among the young people, a longing for freedom and exuberance. Jazz and marching in step just didn't go together. And finally, this aesthetic of individuality went contrary to the leveling down which the system was based upon. After all, that's exactly not what the Nazis had in mind, that each and every one could play his or her own solo. The Nazis raged against jazz, and they tried to ban it from the stage and airwaves. Youth culture, though, cannot be banned, and thus the Nazis at least tried to get it under their control. Instead of jazz, to which they attached any invective Nazi terminology was capable of, they demanded some sort of new German entertainment music, Neue Deutsche Unterhaltungsmusik, which left out the wilder elements of jazz and retained a more plain atmosphere. 
the Nazis then could not kill jazz. While they were annoyed by the people's taste, they really were angry at the fact that jazz seemed to specifically attract the young ones and that it was especially the wilder elements of jazz which they were fascinated by the fact that these young Uh, the, these, the, this use adored musicians who were either black or Jewish. It was jazz as a use culture then which the Nazis hated. Jazz which touched the emotions of the young people who were supposed to give all and themselves to the Führer. It was the non-conformism towards the orders of the National Socialist system which they didn't want to tolerate because of which they sent the swing cats to boot camps. Jazz may not have been an open resistance movement. It definitely was the expression of a need to discover and express oneself. The Nazis, though, were very well uh, aware of the power of music. Um, And Josef Goebbels may have been the first minister for propaganda who made use of mass media whether literature, theater, film, the fine arts, or music, he knew well that any kind of art was so much better suited um, to convey the emotions be behind the ideology than any convention speech. And from 1939, he used mass media for a cultural attack on the enemies. At first, it was just an English language announcer who, as Lord Haw Haw read pro-German commentaries directed towards England on a German shortwave transmitter. Then the saxophone player Lutz Templin was ordered to put together a big band for this part of the program machine of the propaganda machine consisting of the best German musicians after 1940, also hiring musicians from the Netherlands, from Belgium and Italy. This orchestra recorded the popular hits of the day, pieces transcribed directly from the newest Hollywood movies. The vocalist Karl Charlie Schwedler, though in real life a lower assistant at the radio affairs department of the foreign office, did not just sing the original lyrics uh, of these standards, but followed them after the first chorus with propaganda lyrics aimed at reinforcing anti-Semitic resentments which existed in other countries as well, after all, and at the same time aimed at making clear that the war with a supposedly far superior, uh, superior Germany would definitely be lost by the British or other allies. The orchestra, Charlie and his orchestra was, was called, hired the best musicians who were allowed to play jazz as they liked it, hot solos, which might have led to arrest had they performed them in public. Between 1941 and 1943, Charlie and his orchestra, as this band was called, recorded around 270 pieces, all of which, though, were neither for sale nor to be heard in Germany. They were sent to the radio sta stations, transmitting into enemy territory, and many of the records were destroyed right after the war. Nevertheless, enough of them survived, and they allow for an eerie flashback to the time of Nazi Germany, here is one example. It's a, a tune which was originally uh, composed in 1937 for the movie On the Avenue called Slumming on Park Avenue and which was re-Christianed with new lyrics by Schwedler right after the first original chorus to Let's Go Bombing. And make faces when a member of the classes passes Let go smelling where they're dwelling Sniffing everything the way they do Let us go to it, let's do it Why can't we do it too? 
Let's go slamming, no slamming at Pack Avenue. Here is the latest song of the British Airmen. Let's go bombing, oh, let's go bombing. Just like good old British Airmen do. Let us bomb the Frenchmen who were once our allies. England's fight for liberty, we make them realize. From the skies, let's go shelling where they're dwelling. Shelling Nanette, Fifi, and Lulu. Let us go to it. Let's do it. Let's sink their food ships too. Let's go bombing. It's becoming quite the thing to do. You get an idea of the concept and you get an idea of the fact that the music behind these um, propaganda lyrics actually is swing and actually is uh, a jazz. Uh, if we would hear some of the solos, they are pretty well done solos that definitely would not have been um, allowed in, uh, officially allowed to be played in Germany. Other lyrics on, on other t songs talk of Winston Churchill's Jewish friends or of the military superiority of German aircrafts and submarines. And to this day, one gets an idea of how effective such music can be. And to be honest, I thought twice about, um, of, uh, thought twice of including this example in my talk today here in Israel, aware of the history of my country. Um, which brought about the Holocaust and ashamed of the inhumanity of that system which becomes so unbelievable palpable through this music. Short aside, um, jazz as propaganda for democracy. After the war, the US State Department discovered the effectiveness of jazz as a propaganda tool as well. From 1955, the Voice of America aired a daily broadcast hosted by Willis Conover, entitled The Voice of America Jazz Hour, whose fans could be found in those parts of the world which had the least access to recordings by the American jazz heroes, um, particularly behind the Iron Curtain. The show always started like this. Time for jazz. Willis Conover in Washington, D.C. with the Voice of America Jazz Hour. Oops. In special English, which is like the slowest English you can imagine, so that people who don't speak English understand what he's saying. By now, American jazz stars traveled all over the world. When Louis Armstrong returned from a foreign trip in the mid-1950s, and journalists called him an, official, uh, in an unofficial ambassador to the United States, the State Department adopted the idea of using jazz as a, mess, uh, jazz as a uh, metaphor for democracy in countries which were anything but democratic. Okay, not everything was perfect at home. Segregation was only gradually overruled, and the South still had its share of lynchings, and the American government was far from seeing the civil rights movement as a fitting publicity for their own country. At least some in the State Department, though, recognized how the message of jazz might be used to convey political messages as well. Jazz, after all, could be seen as lived, as performed, as sounding democracy, a world in which everybody could chime in and yet one needed all these individuals to achieve the common goal. Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Dave Brubeck and Dizzy Gillespie and many other musicians traveled the world for the State Department. Not always were they happy to be used as a political tool, and from time to time, 
they voiced their dissatisfaction, but here you, here you are, jazz also became a propaganda uh, instrument for the American government. Chapter three, black power, black music. At the same time, the heat was on at home in the United States. The civil rights movement was in full swing in the mid-1960s. Politicians had made big announcements. However, reality had a hard time to follow suit. Many African-American citizens were disappointed by the slow changes uh, and by the fact that these seemed to consist mostly of slight shifts in racist actions. In this kind of political discourse, a number of groups formed who either voted for a slow infiltration of real-life America with the multi-ethnicity of its population, those who were in favor of passive and non-violent um, violent resistance, and the Black Power Movement, which asked for radical changes, not in the future, but now. The arts were not separate from these discussions, and music played an important role within uh, within them. African-American musicians of all genres made sure to point out that all of Af uh, American pop music was of African-American origin. Blues, jazz, swing, bebop, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, even hillbilly and country had black roots after all, not even to mention the latest soul trends. Now, jazz had started its own kind of revolution during these years. In 1959, Ornette Coleman recorded an album entitled The Shape of Jazz to Come, and shortly thereafter, uh, another one called Change of the Century. Sonny Rollins produced his Freedom Suite, and Max Roach recorded with his then-wife Abby Lincoln the Freedom, freedom Now We Insist. New York and Chicago saw the formation of cultural initiatives during these years, which were organized to provide positive role models for the use in the African-American neighborhoods. As in any kind of youth center, sports was, an important, was important in these activities. Discussion groups helped defending one's own positions, and there were a number of classes which were not taught in school, many of them connected to African-American history. There were theater groups and literature circles, as well as music classes, which were meant to foster the young folks' creativity, but which also aimed at a community spirit, supporting the objective of the movement. As we have seen, culture can be political externally, the inter internal sense of community it conveys has a similar function and effect, though. And yet, rarely before have jazz musicians so pointedly seen their art as a message. Rarely before did musicians see their music as anything but entertainment or just as music, as an art form. The intellectual circles of the black arts movement, though, the arts department of the black power movement, if you will, um, the, uh, the, this, these intellectual circles had a clear idea of music, um, of music having to contain a message. Ron Karenga, one of their spokespersons, said, for all art must reflect, and I only can risk my, my, raise my fist to that, for all art must reflect and support, support the black revolution. Um, and he also says, and any art that does not discuss and contribute to the revolution is invalid. With such expectations, black art saw itself in a special dilemma. The whole Western world during the last century saw a broad alienation between the avant-garde and the majority of the art consumers. Artists, theater people, um, composers knew that their art might attract only a relatively small segment of the big audience, and the jazz world was not, uh, not different. And that was not all. Wherever jazz saw and presented itself as avant-garde art, its audience was predominantly white. The jazz avant-garde of the 1960s had two different factions. There were those musicians who worked at an increase in musical abstraction, who tried to break up harmonic, rhythmic, and melodic structures, who focused on 
the improvisatory dialogue. These musicians, uh, like Ornette Coleman or Cecil Taylor, partly John Coltrane, who more and more edited, uh, added spiritual aspects, um, were the one side. And on the other side were musicians like the Art Ensemble of Chicago, which worked with pseudo-ritual references towards Africa in their performances, which were both musically and visually fascinating. And finally, there were musicians who did see themselves as part of this avant-garde, but who wanted to reach a broader audience, or more specifically, a broader black audience. For these means, these musicians went back to genres which were most popular within the African-American communities, the, late, the latest R&B, the early soul music, Motown, all in all pop music, with the blackest traditions possible, with the most mutual roots, with the most shared stylistic devices. Ray Charles and other musicians who were riding the soul wave of the late 1950s used to make use of gospel traditions and its enormous emotional intensity, the cheering riffs between call and response, the happy and optimistic spirit of this kind of music. Gospel always referred to the uplifting celebration of black church service. And of course, it was a childhood experience, a childhood memory for most African Americans. Thus, gospel music made use of an extremely familiar musical field referred to the security of both family and community. And as we have seen, it also referred to a long tradition of resistance strategies, which could be construed as a model by the new movement. To invoke black roots, whether in politics, the arts, or in life, became more and more a sign of solidarity. There is only a slight difference between adopting black church music in 1960s pop and the African-American sportsmen who held up their fist in a black power greeting when they climbed the winner's podium at the Olympic Games in Mexico in 1968. One musician was especially attracted to the movement, including the Black Panthers, the Black Nationalists among them. This musician was Archie Shepp, saxophonist, heavily influenced by John Coltrane, but just as fluent as an author and playwright, a representative of free jazz, both adept at words and sound. Soon after he recorded his first album, Shepp became an advocate for black cultural nationalism. He knew that many musicians of the new thing, as free jazz was called uh, then, did not reach a black audience anymore. And he blamed a middle-class oriented education in the USA for this, which favored European cultural uh, culture, while black children hardly had any positive role models within their own ethnic past. One possibility for bridging the, sp the split between art and popularity, he figured, was to use music as what he called a contemporary form of folk tradition. In a legendary essay for, essay for the Downbeat magazine from September 1965, however, Shep also plays the radical. The essay is entitled, An Artist Speaks Bluntly, and Shep uses a, let's say, poetic, um, aggressive tone in it. Now he attacks. You own the, mu the music and we make it. By definition, then, you own the people who make the music and more. My music is for the people. If you are a bourgeois, then you listen to it on my terms. I will not let you misconstrue me. That era is over. I will say to you in every instance, strike the ghetto. One should no longer be satisfied by using the codes of slavery, he demands. At one point, all of this needs to lead to real change. Music and art in general should fight back, be loud, accuse. But they should, at the same time, convey the familiar warmth of black culture and thus somehow achieve both. Accuse the enemy and reconcile the own community through the art of uh, the act of accusation. This is where Shep's concept of a contemporary folk language plays an important role. Now, if there was one music that could not really be construed as some sort of folk music, though, it was contemporary jazz, which had developed to an intellectual art music by now. 
Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, James Brown, Sly and the Family Stone, the Motown people. This is where a new black music aesthetic formed, one which was extremely popular based upon African-American traditions and which promised control of marketing and distribution channels. Chapter four, Black Lives Matter. Until January of last year, the United States had their first African-American president, yet that did not mean that the problem of racism or injustice between ethnic groups had been solved. As a matter of fact, during the last three or four years, the ugly side of racism became more visible again in the United States, especially in the police brutality against black Americans. The reasons are complex. Be besides open racism, you have the uneven distribution of wealth, a lacking social system such as we know in Western Europe, the gun lobby, of course, which makes sure that citizens are armed to the teeth and much more. Again, a movement formed which demanded change, which demanded also the reappraisal of the past, the acceptance of responsibility. Black Lives Matter. The movement's slogan, and uh, when I try to explain this to Germans, I usually explain it by comparing it to the ref Refugees Welcome uh, campaign against racism and xenophobia, which so many people took uh, part in in recent years during the refugee crisis. Musicians start to take up um, positions. Of course, the pop, mu the pop music faction may have a bigger audience. Just think of Prince's grandiose and highly political video, Baltimore, from uh, the 21st of July 2015 about the deaths of Freddie Gray and Michael Brown. Jazz, in its most advanced forms, has distanced itself so far from the broad mess that its statements hardly count anymore. Now don't misunderstand me, contemporary music does not have to be popular music. Instead, it often is what I would call the research department of artistic development. And yet, musicians to this day make again and again political statements relevant to present time. The pianist VJ Iyer, for instance, in 2010, performed his Veterans Dreams Project, a musical realization of unsettling reports from veterans who had served in Afghanistan about their recurring dreams. And there are innumerable examples referring directly to Black Lives Matters. The trumpeter Terence Blanchard called one of his late uh, last albums, Breathless thus alluding to Eric Garner's helpless shouts, I can't breathe while he died being taken in a headlock by the New York police. The New Orleans-based trumpet a Christian Scott makes no secret from feeling political, political responsibility as a musician. And the shooting star of jazz, the saxophonist Kamadi Washington from Los Angeles, in a concert he gave on 25th July 2015 in Los Angeles, with colleagues from the jazz and the hip hop world, refers to riots and unrest in the African American neighborhoods in Los Angeles in 1965 and 1992 and connects these retrospective glances with the present of Black Lives Matter. Let's have a look at a report by the LA Weekly. What's the liquid? It's tad from the group that the chicks want to get with. I kicked it from the east all the way to the west. Yes, stay away from it. I put the hair up on your chest. And that's a little piece of advice. For what we're doing is we're doing a musical comparison between the 65 Watts Rebellion and the 1992 LA Outlaws. Jazz in 65, hip hop in 92. All LA artists, we decide what it is, what it's going to be, how it's going to be. It's just amazing for us to come together at this time right now for the 65 to 92 performances, especially in a time right now when everything's really stressful right now. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. There's things we need to overcome as an individual and as a people collective. We never flinch. We take with script as the sky as high as a blip. And saving our savings, no generation of whips. We go and it is now 1965 and 1992 and 2015. And those children of slaves are still here. <laughs> 
Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, children. The people that came before us and the people that are going to come after us, how are they going to see us? How are they going to see what we gave to the earth, what we gave to the world, what we gave to humanity? The jazz side and the hip hop side and bring it together and really show the people that the music really carries the movement. As a musician, um, my music, all it is, all any music is music, all any music you've ever heard, all it is, it's an expression of your experience. So the musicians of 1965 were expressing the experience of the people of 1965. And the musicians that are making music in 1992 were expressing the experience of the people of 1992. And when historically, when you look back at the things that were happening in 65 and happening in 92, there's a parallel, there's a connection. And that connection is like a four-way connection, it's like the fourth dimension, you know. Um, and what we're going to do tonight is we're going to connect history, society, music, sound, and experience. You know, we have the power. And more than we have the power, we are the power. We're gonna turn this party out. Now, music does not have to have a political agenda. Music does not need to be anything but music. The conviction that jazz always is about Resistance usually comes from fans and critics who feel they might need some justification to, fan, to defend the social relevance of their music. And yet, did you read um, the closing credits? The rhythm changes, but the struggle remains. Music, after all, accompanies our experience of reality, of social changes, our, our wishes, hopes, and our frustrations. It's not different today than it was in the 1960s. Jazz musicians still move their audience to tears as Sonny Rollins did when he played without a song in a concert just days after 9-11, suggesting that after such catastrophes, there really are no words. Yet music should never stop sounding because it has a purpose. To this day, jazz musicians can scream away their fury as Archie Shepp and others did in the 1960s. Music will not be able to solve social problems, but music can help to process fury, helplessness, and grief. Music is hard to exploit, not by politics, not by state departments, not even by civil rights movements. And yet, do you remember uh, my first example, which I, which I played at the beginning, Barack Obama singing Amazing Grace in Charleston? Do you remember the faces of the unprepared clergymen behind him. Even in today's global age, music is a place of solidarity, of community, of finding oneself. It generates memories, it conciliates, and it raises something that may seem more important today than since a long time, it raises hope. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, that was quite intense and a lot of subjects that you uh, you put in and all the time I'm, I'm thinking really in a sense like jazz which basically is a Afro-American type of music is it still really relevant like it's been it was used by others at the beginning as you pointed out and even now, when we see it, now it's like the musicians are using it, but they're using it as uh, jazz and and uh, rap and everything together. If jazz has not, in a way, since it's become Europe Europeanized, in a sense that it's become a kind of that we teach it in the university, if it hasn't lost its its relevance in that sense, are you seriously asking me that as a musician? No, I'm asking. No, I'm not. Ask, I'm asking you that as someone who's looking at the music. Okay. Um, you go for one. <laughs> there we go. Um, 
No, I think, I mean, that, uh, at one point I, I, I said, I have the feeling that jazz is kind of the research department of contemporary music. So you can, you can experiment and you can see what's possible and you can you improvise and you try out new constellations. Uh, so it is, it is necessary. Is relevance only dictated by how many people do you reach or is relevance uh, uh, perhaps dictated by the message? But you're right, I mean, it's a question that I have, um, we talked about it the other day, that I have uh, um, very often, especially looking at what is happening in America and how American musicians are able to make political statements with their music. And then I asked myself, do I know any German musician who's making a political statement today? And to be honest, I don't know I don't really know a lot. I, I couldn't really put my, my finger. And I mean, maybe you can ask the same. The, pardon me? Uta Lemper, the, the singer. Uta Lemper makes a political statement? Well, that's, uh, that's how I thought when I saw her uh, some years ago here in, in Lax. Okay, so then, but then the political statement is perhaps not in the music, but by, by performing in Israel and performing properly a repertoire of uh, Brechtweil or whatever she did then. So yes, that's possibly, yeah, there you go, that's actually somebody. People would argue, is she a jazz singer? <laughs> but, um, you know, my, as my colleague always says, music is jazz as well, so we basically, we, we, we like to see everything as jazz. But yeah, but otherwise it's, um, and that's probably something that the, the United States, it's much more, much easier in the United States to see music politically as, uh, as it is in other countries. At least in Germany, it's really hard. Any questions from the audience? Yes. It's very difficult to use American music as an idiom to express political opinions in other countries. It's not natural. So I don't see any uh, surprise. I'm not surprised by the fact that in Germany, nobody uses jazz to declare something politically. This is only in America. I dare to disagree. I think that... Um, by now, and I'm talking about the youngest generation. So I'm talking about the generation of musicians between 20 and 30 or 35, who have not only grown up with jazz as an Amer African American music, but have grown up being influenced by, uh, at least in, for, when, when I talk about Europe, being influenced by European musicians like Manfred Schoff, Peter Brötzmann, uh, Jan Gawarek, and others. J who had just as strong an influence on them as Americans. They have a complete different um, uh, perception of this language of jazz um, than, than the generation before. Before that, you are absolutely right. It was a foreign language that one was speaking. But with the younger generation, no, they, they adopted it as, it as their own. And it's probably... I don't know, one could ask the same question about other forms of, and I'm specifically talking about instrumental music, is, you know, are musicians in the field of contemporary composition, are they actually um, uh, approaching and, and looking at the struggles of the world today? And jazz, I don't see it, at least, you know, for the, for the countries that I know m most about, except for the states. And my explanation for the States is that it was always easier in the United States to make a bold statement, whereas Europe always had this um, 200 years of so-called, um, you have to help me, um, uh, um, uh, Aufklärung. Enlightenment. Enlightenment, you know, so-called so enlightenment um, that was kind of in the way uh, and made uh, discourses a little more difficult. I don't know. Yes, um, coming from the States, uh, there seems to be a reflowering of jazz 
among high school students. For example, the Ellington series that brings, I come from Seattle, we come from Seattle, where we, there's just jazz proliferating all around, and it seems <coughs> even in places like Tucson and other small towns. And I wondered if you care to comment on whether jazz, in fact, is growing with its audience uh, rather than shrinking. And the Lincoln Center Jazz. Yeah. Well, the Lincoln Center Jazz um, audience is uh, an audience of my age and higher. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that, that's probably, an, that wouldn't be a, a, an example for a growing audience. A colleague of mine, mine has this wonderful analogy. He always says, how do I translate it? Idiotendichte bleibt immer gleich. The density of idiots will always stay the same. And I find that so unbelievably reassuring because if the density of idiots will always be, uh, remain the same, that means that also the density of people who are interested in finding something new will always be the same, no matter what we think is happening. I, be I believe that young people will always be creative. They will discover creative ways of expressing themselves, and I don't care whether that is called jazz or anything else, as long as it's creative. So that is actually happening. There is a uh, more, a little bit of more popularity, especially in the States, for jazz history than it used to be a while ago, but it has nothing to do with um, what, uh, you know, people who lived through the 1950s or the 1960s actually perceived as, as as jazz, but it's, it has more of a, oh, this sounds nice, and it's a, kind of a nostalgic uh, uh, flair to it. And the same holds true, by the way, it's not only the state, the same holds true also for a lot of European countries. And uh, I have the feeling here in Israel as well. Yes. Um, hi, again, thank you for this wonderful lecture, again. Uh, um, so I was wondering about um, the issue that Dan, I thought at least, alluded to in a way, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, to, the, to the issue of race. So first of all, I don't think that in Europe necessarily um, jazz remains an American art form or musical genre. I mean, um, and if we agree that every sort of art form, I mean, we don't have to agree, but there is this opinion that every art form is in a way political, anything can be political. Um, whether we can consider uh, Jagger Reinhardt, for example, a political artist, and in a way, perhaps jazz by definition, there's something subversive about it exactly because it is not classic, exactly because of the, because of the second example you brought with the um, the German example. Yeah. And um, so, but I was wondering about uh, the 1960s and 70s um, about non-African American jazz in the States. Um, Jeremy Yudkin from Boston University, who wrote a book about the history of jazz, once uh, told me that uh, he's completely opposed to the definition of jazz as an African American musical form. <coughs> and. Um, regardless of whether we can agree with that or, or, or whether it's uh, controversial, um, I was wondering about sort of white jazz during the period of sort of political upheaval in the States, Dave Lubeck, others. Was that, did, were they involved in the political sort of atmosphere? Well, Brubeck is one of the examples. You know, he was sent around by the State Department, so he was basically used as a propaganda by the propaganda machine of, of uh, the United States. Um, and um, that's a good question. You know, the people who are the majority and who don't feel the pressure don't necessarily need to feel or might not need uh, uh, might not might not feel the need to. Um, to establish community, and um, what I, what what African American efforts in the 1960s, and that's why I why why I talked a little bit about um, you know the school project by the associate by the AACM in Chicago, uh, where um, making music and avant making avant-garde music was part of educational projects because. Um, 
they had the sense that their community was were eroding and they needed to reaffirm the communities whereas uh the 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 white american uh population didn't need that so there was no direct need for that so i think that is perhaps one answer um in free jazz free jazz very often used to be uh, uh interpreted as a political because if you you know if you think that if you think that all um uh, all all rules have been done with um then you think oh that's like revolution that's actually that could be a revolution that's like you know what we have in politics so no actually even peter brotsman's um a uh, great album uh, uh, machine gun which you know just it's just a lot of noise you think it has perfect structure it's like a, it has ritornellos it has things that you wouldn't imagine in there because you're so you're so um, you're so much focusing on the noise element of it and on the on 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 the on the force which seems political I would like to just to say that white uh, musicians, I mean, even if you take Dave Brubeck, his, his decision to take a black bass player, and uh, when he was asked to perform in like for television, and they would cut him, cut him out, then he then he wouldn't agree to perform. Uh, there were uh, in the sixties there was. Uh, Concerts raising funds. There were the free riders during the '60s, and you could see Jerry Mulligan appearing in them, a white musician. Um, I think part part of the the what the whites would I would say like Benny Goodman as an example of being the first white musician to include black musicians in his uh, orchestra, even if at the beginning it was like a quartet not within the big orchestra. These were steps. I mean, mostly the musicians. I say it even today. Most musicians are left-wing in general, being b because they 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 music is a connection between people, and when you play music, you realize everyone's the same, and you're not limited by kind of ideologies. I mean, yesterday the example that you know, I played with an oud player here in Israel, who's who who he and I, I mentioned this when I introduced him, because he got the like when he was in Egypt. And uh, and he won the 2003 prize for playing Oud. They introduced him as a Palestinian, and I introduced him as a Palestinian. I don't care. I I don't care. You know, it it doesn't for me. It doesn't matter. We live in Israel. They want to define. So you had all these people that did try to improve just by playing with the blacks or by contrib tr contributing. Um, that's my kind of perception. Wolfram's proposal was, if I rightly understood, to explicitly differentiate between the political message of the music per se and the use or misuse of this music by all sorts of factors or forces. And these are absolutely different questions. I mean, the music is one thing, and it, it is always the question. I mean, w once you play whatever piece of music, and you don't give the explanations, and you don't see any video, and you don't know the title, and you don't know the musicians, etc., etc., ask yourself what do you then understand regarding the political message. And the, the other things concern the, the, the para the metadata, the, the whatever, uh, which might be political, I mean, that's once, once again, I mean, they are political, of course, right, they are political, but this is an absolutely different question than the question regarding the music itself. And sometimes, uh, and I think Wolfram is absolutely right, sometimes uh, I would call them powerful factors or manipulating forces understood correctly. We, we, we have to admit it. I mean, the Nazis understood correctly that the nature of jazz might be, we would say, misused, but anyhow used politically. They were absolutely right. But they couldn't get, but they couldn't get rid of it. 
it's interesting in the fact that you know they, they were, there were three types of music that they wanted to get rid of. Jewish music, which is no problem. You know who the composer is, so you get rid of him. Contemporary classic music, that's, you know, I, I usually define it as, and excuse me because you're a contemporary composer, but usually music that you don't really want to listen to, so that's no problem. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, uh, well, well, let's say the majority. But, and third, jazz, which jazz is a way of performing. It's not, you, you can't, and you know, I, I read like, you know, the swing kids, etc. It's like they would, you know, the, the moment they knew that the, the regime would come in, then they played the same tune, but you know, with no syncopation. And the moment they left, it's back to, you know, playing. So, so it's really very hard. And the fact that Goebbels used, he, he finally, he used this type of music. You know, it's, it's very, jazz is very kind of complicated in that sense. But, and, and I would say trying to, Take a piece of music and give it a political, just the music itself as a, as a you know as a sound source. I don't know if it's possible. We 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 are not we we can't. That's like taking. We always like. I remember that Achinom uh, Nini um, performed with um, no the Arab. Uh, help me here, the Arab. Ma Imiri Awad. It was a political statement. It's not a song. Is it, so, so it's, it, I, I think. But it doesn't make it jazz. No, no, I'm not. I, I'm not. I, I was now talking music in general. Not. Uh, yes, please. Regarding uh, those ideas, uh, by the way, I think that jazz, as an idea, uh, can uh, express uh, a political way of thinking, and I think that jazz is left wing within music. I think there's a part of music that is not really left-wing. If you take some of the marches, or if you listen to Wagner, I'm not sure it's exactly left-wing. When you even listen to it, without connecting it to the person and without connecting it to the regime, okay? Just listen to the music. You hear order. You hear discipline. And I think... In, no, I mean Wagner. Uh, okay. <coughs> and in jazz, as, as an idea, I think it's left-wing as an idea because, um, uh, and, and it's very interesting, by the way, the example that you gave of the use of, of the big bands by the German propaganda, uh, Nazi propaganda, um, because I think that jazz as, as a principle defies uh, authority. And what jazz says is that the opposite of order is not anarchy. The opposite of order is freedom. And, uh, and when, you, when you listen to something and you say, okay, that's jazz, for me, when I say, okay, that's jazz, it means that there's the freedom of the performer, of the performer, the freedom of the performance, and still there's a theme Still, there's harmony. Still, there's something getting organized between people, but with with freedom, <coughs> and that is something that defies defies authority as as a principle, and that's what left wing is in politics. I think I would stay probably stay for personally. I would stay away from um, from the word freedom there. Because I think it's more about curiosity, it's more about individuality. So those are things, because freedom is so loaded, you know, that's when we, we, we it, it is, it's, it's a moral term. Can you be curious and, and searching without being free to do that? You need for, for curiosity and for searching yes. yourself yeah. and connections, you have to be free. And yet, freedom is a loaded term that we associate with. I, I know exactly what it is. So we're we're on the same page. And yet, I would probably use words like individuality, curiosity, and others, which makes, yeah. Okay, we have to move on. I must say, uh, all this. I mean, that's one of the reasons that with this this convention, and I'm really happy that you came. And uh, well, we'll see you. Thank you very much. Yes.